Joseph de Maestre was a prominent Savoyard philosopher and intellectual who wrote during the end of the 18th and the beginning of the 19th century. He belonged to a bourgeois family which had during the time of his father been elevated to the rank of nobility. His adolescent life was fairly uneventful. He studied law and theology and spent several years as a Freemason. This was not something unusual for aristocrats at the time and was not altogether incompatible with belonging to the Catholic faith. The Maestro would later describe Freemasonry as a combination of Platonism and Christianity. Even after leaving the organization, he did not condemn it, arguing that, although it was by no means a substitute for genuine religious faith, it did provide a shield against the raging atheism among the intellectual classes through its affirmation of the immortality of the human soul. The outbreak of the French Revolution was met by the master with reserved optimism. As the events progressed, however, this would quickly turn into hostility. By the late 1790s, the master had made a name for himself as one of the fiercest critics of the revolution and all that it stood for. His most famous work, called Considerations on France, represents a reactionary treatise in defense of the French monarchy and the Catholic Church against what the author considers Jacobin barbarism. With the spread of the revolution and the start of the Napoleonic Wars, the master ended up leaving the European mainland and settling in Sardinia to work in the court of King Victor Emmanuel I. The king and his aristocrats appreciated the master's great intellect and literary talent. At the same time, however, his sharp and overcritical remarks oftentimes scandalized the king's court. This eventually led to the Maestro becoming too uncomfortable and being sent off to Russia to work as a Sardinian minister in St. Petersburg for several years. There are two key aspects of the Maestro as a thinker that contribute to the originality and power of his philosophy. On the one hand is his sincere spirituality and belief in the divine providence which guides world history. On the other is his ability to observe human affairs from a historical distance and come up with what are sometimes chilling conclusions about the nature of the human condition. These two tendencies coincide and complement each other perfectly in his defense of the traditional European monarchy against the encroaching tides of progress. The Maestro states that, quote, Every nation, like every individual, has received a mission that it must fulfill. France exercises over Europe a veritable magistracy that it would be useless to contest and that she has most culpably abused. In particular, she was at the head of the religious system and not without reason was her king called the most Christian. Since she has used her influence to contradict her vocation and demoralize Europe, we should not be surprised if she is brought back to her mission by terrible means. Crimes done in the name of the nation are crimes of the nation itself. The regicide of Louis XVI was an evil deed with too many accomplices. This does not include only the rebels and agitators, but also intellectuals and everyone who, for the decades leading up to the revolution, had worked to secularize and liberalize France. The revolution was France's rebellion against God, and the terror that followed was her providential punishment. The master states that no royal authority could have punished the revolutionaries as totally and severely as their own creation had done. The French Revolution was an eruption of chaos which devoured the politicians, orators and intellectuals that had inspired it. Once unleashed, the revolution did not allow itself to be controlled. One by one, its leaders fell after that particular phase of the revolution had ended. At the same time, however, France had remained intact against all odds. This was an indication for the master that providence still had a use for the French nation and that after the bloodshed, a restored French Catholic monarchy would emerge. The master's descriptions of the evils of the revolutionary terror led him to a general analysis about the nature of man. He fervently disagreed with the philosophers of the Enlightenment over their understanding of man as being fundamentally rational and a pursuer of happiness. 
In his analysis of history, the master observed that man has a consistent tendency towards violence and savagery. This is his original sin, his inbuilt flaw. The history of humanity is largely a history of warfare and bloodlust. The master did not completely deny the noble and rational aspects of man, who was, after all, created in God's image. Yet, as history shows, these benign aspects do not seem to manifest themselves nearly as often as the lower animalistic instincts do. The master concluded that for a civilized social order to exist at all, an external authority would be necessary, one through which the positive tendencies of man would be allowed to rule over and restrict the negative ones. Power was something which the master had great appreciation for, because only through strong authority could any social order be maintained. In this context, he even allowed himself to express certain positive views of Robespierre and the Jacobins, saying that despite their horrific crimes, their strength and brutality at least succeeded in preserving the political unity of France. Any authority, therefore, even an unlawful one, was preferable to no authority at all. Power in itself was a necessary yet not a sufficient condition for the existence of a civilized society. Legitimacy was also needed. The master arrived at a two-point defensive monarchy. Monarchy was for him the only valid state form for the French, because it was the only legitimate one, the only one sanctioned by the Creator and the Holy Church. At the same time, monarchy was for the master the only state form that could endure in the long term. Any social order established on the basis of human reason will soon find itself undermined by the very same reason. Rationality was for the master something shaky and impermanent. For political authority to be lasting, it must have its roots in the mystical beyond of divinity, where the sterilizing force of rationality may not easily penetrate. Isaiah Berlin generalizes the master's position on this matter as follows. The master wants government to be traditional, he wants government to be ancient, he wants government to be established, and he wants it to be established in the poetry, the mythology, the imagination, the tradition, the irrational creative faculties of man, in his mythological and his poetic self. Monarchy was therefore the ideal state form for France, both from a spiritual moral perspective as well as from a practical one. As for the collapse of the monarchy of Louis XVI, the master attributes this to the fact that the philosophes of the Enlightenment had been granted too much freedom to publicly promote their supposedly progressive ideals. The weakness and tolerance of the last king had thus proven to be his downfall in the long term. The master believed in censorship and argued that for civilization to be maintained certain corrosive social elements must be kept out of public positions from where they might influence the masses and ignite future revolutions. The master's political insight allowed him to predict with great accuracy how the French monarchical restoration would happen. Having lived to see it, however, he was disappointed by the new government and became convinced that the progressive forces would ultimately be triumphant in their struggle against tradition. Shortly before his death, the master wrote a letter to a friend of his in which he said, I die with Europe, I am in good company. <laughs> <laughs>